Before you listen, if you enjoy the stories and want to hear more, then please consider subscribing. Most of you listening aren't subscribed, so please take this time to subscribe. Turn on notifications so you'll never miss a story and be the first to hear. You'll also be supporting me. Thank you. You see, online dating is a bit like a lottery, isn't it? Sometimes you strike gold, sometimes you strike out, and sometimes you land smack dab in the middle of a freaky tale that keeps you up at night. This is my story with Victoria of a witching beauty from Tinder, or at least, that's who I thought she was. Her profile is one of those that you can't help but notice. A stunning brunette with bright green eyes that sparkled with a hint of mischief. Her bio was witty, packed with references from my favorite books, TV shows, and even an obscure indie band that I adore. Our chat was full of flirtatious banter and shared interests. It felt like I hit the jackpot, or at least that's what I thought. We decided to meet up at a hip local coffee shop downtown. I remember being a bit nervous, fumbling with my tie, checking my breath, the usual pre-date jitters. As I entered, I immediately scanned the room, looking for the brunette beauty I was expecting. But she wasn't there. Instead, there was a woman sitting in a corner who seemed out of place. Her eyes kept darting nervously around the room. She caught sight of me and gave me a little wave. With a sinking feeling, I realized that this woman was Victoria, or at least the real Victoria. She was nothing like the woman in the pictures. She was significantly older, her hair was lighter, and she lacked the sparkle in her eyes that had initially drawn me in. I was taken aback, thrown off, even a little angry, but I decided to go through with a date mostly out of a morbid sense of curiosity. Throughout our coffee date, I couldn't help but feel a sense of betrayal. The woman sitting across from me wasn't the witty, adventurous person I thought I had been connecting with. She seemed nervous, her hand shaking slightly as she held her coffee mug. Our conversation was stilted, her replies shallow and absent of the charm and wit that I had come to associate with her. As the date continued into the night, my intrigue turned to discomfort. Victoria was an adept conversationalist, there was no doubt about that. But as we delved deeper into the conversation, her interests and opinions took a disturbing turn. She spoke at length about her beliefs, many of which were deeply unsettling. She had an almost dismissive attitude towards the concept of honesty, claiming it to be an overrated virtue. She explained, without a hint of guilt or remorse, how she often told white lies to manipulate situations to her favor. Then she delved into her fascination with the lives of others, confessing to an almost voyeuristic interest in personal dramas. She seemed to take a certain amount of pleasure in the knowledge that she wasn't alone in her struggles and miseries. This lack of empathy was startling, and it painted a chilling picture of the person in front of me. Then came the revelation that left me speechless. She shared her disdain for people who took online dating seriously, branding them as desperate and naive. As she discussed this, there was a look in her eyes, a kind of cold amusement that left me deeply uncomfortable. It was as if the deception, the manipulation, was just a game to her, a game she took perverse pleasure in. It was clear that the person I had been chatting with wasn't the same one sitting across from me. The shared interests, the witty banter, the apparent connection, it all felt like a well-constructed lie. I ended the date as quickly as I could, making up some excuse about an urgent errand. Once home, I sent her a message confronting her about the deception. She tried to play it off as filters and lighting, but the damage was done. I was hurt, confused, and I felt betrayed. This was no simple misunderstanding. This was a deliberate and calculated act of deception. I reported her to Tinder and blocked her immediately. In the following days, I had to grapple with the reality of my situation. I had been catfished. It was like someone had pulled the rug from under my feet. I'd allowed myself to be vulnerable, to open up to someone, only to find out it was all based on a lie. The experience left me wary and a little disillusioned. It served as a harsh reminder of the potential dangers lurking behind the glamorous facade of online dating. I became more cautious, more skeptical. Every new profile of every match was met with a little suspicion. Before Tinder came into my life, everything was ordinary. It was like I was stuck on a loop doing the same things every day. Wake up, hustle at my 9 to 5, shoot some pool with the boys, and hit the sack. Rinse and repeat. It was a monotony I wanted to shake off, and the adrenaline rush of the dating scene seemed to be just the thing. For days, it was a blur of faces. Swipe left, swipe right, left, right like a boring rhythm. 
Some faces blended together, some stood out, but none clicked. It was like looking for a diamond in a heap of stones. That's when I saw Frida. She was like a jolt of electricity. Her profile picture wasn't like the other perfectly posed pictures. It was raw, real, different. She had her vibrant blue hair pulled up in a messy bun, a streak of paint across her cheek, and the biggest grin on her face. Her glasses were slightly askew, adding to her charm. She was not just different, she was unique. Her bio was a labyrinth of weirdness, and it was intriguing. It was filled with her love for punk rock music, vegan food, and her passion for painting. It gave me a glimpse of her world, and I was hooked. I couldn't help but swipe right, feeling an odd mix of curiosity and excitement. The familiar, it's a match, popped up on my screen, and my heart skipped a beat. That's how Frida entered my life, like a breath of fresh air, shaking my monotonous world, making it a little more colorful. That initial excitement, the rush of getting to know someone new, the shared laughs, the endless chats, everything felt amazing. Frida was a bright spot in my otherwise dull days, and I was looking forward to what lay ahead. We decided to meet up for a date. I picked a cozy vegan restaurant in the heart of the city. I remember being nervous and excited at the same time. It was like stepping into an unfamiliar territory. Little did I know it was to start a roller coaster ride. Fast forward to our first date, the picture perfect scene under the soft lighting of a swanky vegan restaurant. A picture perfect scene, well, until she arrived, 10 minutes late. Despite my annoyance, her captivating smile won me over. Yet, as the evening wore on, her enchanting exterior started to crack, revealing oddities. She laughed too loud at my jokes, gave me awkward stares, and delved into strange, discomforting stories. Despite the red flags, I thought maybe I was reading too much into it, trying to justify it as just being different. The following day, my mind kept replaying the dinner scene, a loud laughter, the strange tales, the chills I felt despite the warm ambience. The discomfort set in, like a steady hum in the back of my head. Finally, I decided to end it politely, of course, hoping she would take it well. But all hell broke loose. My phone exploded with messages, each one worse than the last. She transformed from a mildly odd date to an angry, vengeful force. I was hit with a barrage of disturbing messages, the violent undertones, the threats. My hopes of her taking it well were crushed, replaced with a growing fear. The dread grew with each passing day. I'd wake up to more messages, each more brutal, each making my heart pound harder. The fear started leaking into my physical space when crumpled handwritten letters began appearing at my doorstep. Each paper oozed with vile threats, each line filled with rage, sending chills down my spine. The safety of my home was violated, transforming into a horror set. The nightmare escalated when I found my car with slashed tires, a chilling note daring me to escape her wrath. I was living in a state of terror, losing my appetite, my sleep disturbed by nightmares of her threats coming to life. I felt trapped in my own life, each day steeped in dread, each night a terrifying ordeal. Despite the fear, I gathered courage and went to the police, but without concrete proof, their hands were tied, their skepticism evident. My friends thought I was pulling a prank, not comprehending the gravity of the situation. The world seemed to be turning a blind eye to my ordeal, leaving me isolated in my fears. My life had turned into a paranoia-fueled thriller, every corner holding potential danger. The incessant buzzing of my phone became a precursor to my rising fear, every new message a new terror to grapple with. At work, I jumped at the slightest noise, my nerves frayed, my mind haunted by the unseen terror. This terror consumed me, held me hostage. Every moment was a step further into the darkness. My reality had morphed into a waking nightmare, from which there seemed to be no escape. I was sinking deeper into this terrifying abyss, each threat pulling me further in. So here I am sharing my story. A cautionary tale from a nightmarish Tinder date. I'm still trapped, still looking for a way out, hoping it ends soon. If you ever venture into this weird world of Tinder, remember my story. You might be in for a surprise. So once, I had matched on Tinder with a girl, let's call her person X because I'm certain she didn't tell me her real name, who seemed cool. We were into the same obscure bands, cult horror films, and offbeat comedy shows. After chatting for over a week, we finally made plans to grab dinner and see a movie downtown for our first date. I arrived at the restaurant and immediately recognized person X from her photos. 
She gave me a quick hug, then we were promptly seated by the hostess. As we browsed the menus, the conversation flowed easily. Person X was witty with a bit of a dark, sarcastic sense of humor that I really vibed with. We discovered we had both recently moved to the city for work and didn't know many other people in town yet. Person X told me all about how she loathed her mundane office job and had to deal with an overbearing boss who didn't respect her. I found her candidness and openness very refreshing. She seemed charming, smart, and easy to talk to. After we finished eating, we walked together to the old movie theater right down the block to catch a late showing of a new indie horror film. It felt like the perfect activity given our mutual macabre sensibilities. We stopped the concession stand and I offered to buy us a tub of popcorn to share. We continued chatting comfortably as we found seats and waited for the movie previews to start. About 30 minutes into the film I started feeling really strange. An intense wave of dizziness, nausea, and mental fog hit me out of nowhere. I shifted around in my seat trying to focus on the screen, assuming I just had indigestion or something didn't agree with me. But the disturbing feeling rapidly intensified. The theater began spinning and tilting around me. My limbs felt heavy and detached. My responses grew sluggish and blurred. I leaned over to tell person X that I wasn't feeling well at all and may need some fresh air or a step out. But when I glanced over, her seat was empty. She had completely vanished from the theater though I had literally just seen her sitting right next to me minutes before. Thoroughly confused, I stumbled out of the dark theater, using the aisle handrails to steady my jelly legs. The theater lights in the lobby blinded me as I made my way to the bathroom, the world around me blurring and muted. After splashing some water on my face and taking deep breaths, I stared at my ghostly pale reflection in the mirror. Pupils dilated into pinpricks, cold sweat dripping down my clammy neck. Something was definitely very wrong here. I managed to make it outside to the curb and sat down heavily, the cool night air helping clear my foggy head slightly. As I tried to get my bearings, I reached for my phone to check the time and maybe call an Uber home. But my pocket was empty. That's when I realized my wallet was also missing. No cash, no cards, no ID, nothing. It finally dawned on me that I had almost certainly been drugged. Person X must have coverly slipped something into one of my drinks back at the restaurant when I wasn't looking. A pill's dissolving in a water glass, or something sprinkled on top of my food perhaps. I felt so incredibly stupid and ashamed for letting my guard down with the stranger. Somehow I managed to beg a kind passerby to let me borrow their phone for a minute to call 911. I could barely explain what had happened to the emergency dispatcher, my speech still badly slurred. Soon a patrol officer arrived and interviewed me there on the curb. Unfortunately, he was polite but doubtful about my fuzzy story. He said that without any evidence of an actual crime beyond my missing items and fragmented memory, it was simply my word against this person, ex-girls. The officer took down a report but lamented there was likely little more the police could do with such limited information and no proof of wrongdoing. He recommended I cancel all my credit cards immediately if they had been in my wallet. The next day in better health, I returned to both the restaurant and movie theater to plead my case to the managers and ask if they had any security camera footage that can corroborate even small details of my story. The restaurant manager did vaguely recognize me and confirmed I had been there the night before with a female companion. However, he regretfully informed me the camera angle at our table didn't clearly show whether this person, X person, had tampered with my food or drinks. The theater manager was able to locate footage of me entering alongside a young woman who generally matched person X description and clothing, but the video quality was quite grainy and inadequate to definitively identify her or prove conclusively that I didn't willingly wander off alone while potentially blacked out. Without any solid evidence of criminal activity, the police concluded it was likely just an ordinary day gone wrong. They conjectured either I had gotten too drunk and blacked out misplacing on a wallet somewhere along the way or that I simply had buyer's remorse after splurging on dinner for some mystery girl I barely knew. No matter how insistently I pleaded my version of events, I was just another clueless guy who couldn't handle his liquor or a casual Tinder date gone away. The authorities completely dismissed my adamant claims of being drugged and robbed. But I knew the truth even if I couldn't prove it. I had been targeted, violated, and left discarded like trash on the street by someone I mistakenly thought I could trust. This person X saw me as an easy mark after monitoring my patterns online and played the part of charming date flawlessly. 
She was patient, watching for the perfect opportunity to slip something potent into my drink when I finally let my guard down. In the weeks after, I became incredibly paranoid any time I went out in public, constantly scanning faces and crowds for anyone even vaguely resembling person X. I replayed our conversations over and over, searching in vain for some small sign or clue in her words or gestures that could have tipped me off about her underlying predatory nature. I avoided dating apps completely for months afterward, my fundamental faith in others decimated by the experience. I felt like there was no way to truly protect myself from such insidious threats hiding themselves in plain sight all around me. Over time the anxiety diminished, but it still remains dormant ready to resurface whenever I let my guard down again. I never heard from person X after that night, though I know she likely moved on to stalk other potential victims online. I was just another disposable mark in her eyes, isolated and intoxicated by her charm, and she played me masterfully, vanishing like a phantom into the night with her prize. I still shudder when I think back on the night a seemingly normal first date I met through Tinder rapidly turned scary and sinister. This guy, Dan, had appeared pleasant enough over sushi, but when he insisted on coming back to my place after walking me to my car, and I politely declined, he became angrily forceful and essentially trapped me in my own home against my will. Thank God, in that terrifying moment, I managed to stay calm enough to barricade myself in the bathroom and call the police, who arrived in time to apprehend him before he could physically harm me. But the entire traumatic ordeal left me shaken to my core, realizing how much worse it could have ended had luck not been on my side. It started out as just another pretty standard first date with a guy from the dating app. Dan was late twenties like me, decent looking in a sort of nondescript way, and had seemed nice enough over messaging. We met at a popular sushi restaurant downtown one Friday evening. Over dinner, as we made the usual first date small talk, he came across as a perfectly pleasant, if unremarkable guy. He asked the typical getting to know you questions about my job, family, pop culture interests. I reciprocated to be polite. Nothing raised any red flags initially. After we finished eating and chatting for about an hour, Dan offered to walk me in my car parked down the block like a gentleman. As we strolled through the darkened parking lot, we continued casually talking about possibly meeting up again if we both had fun. When we reached my car, he went in for a quick goodbye hug there by my driver's side door. Again, this all seemed perfectly normal and cordial for a first meeting. But as I was unlocking my door to get inside, Dan suddenly asked if he could see me again very soon because he had genuinely enjoyed the night and felt we really connected. I responded noncommittally saying I wasn't sure, but we could text later. That's what he blurted out boldly, asking if he could actually come back to my place for a quick drink. This brazen question completely took me aback. It seemed highly presumptuous and far too forward, considering we had literally just met for the first time a couple hours prior. I politely but firmly declined his invitation, explaining that I didn't feel comfortable with him coming over this soon. But he persisted, insisting how he was such a nice guy, and it would be so fun and casual if we just hung out a bit longer. It was clear Dan felt entitled to my company and space, simply because I had agreed to one date. His pushy tone toward getting what he wanted was really off-putting. When I held my ground about not wanting him over tonight, he grew visibly angry and defensive. As I tried getting into my driver's seat to leave, he suddenly grabbed at my car door so that I couldn't shut it. Dan demanded again that I let him come inside, saying I somehow owed him the courtesy after he had paid for an expensive dinner. Raw fear spiked through me sharply as I realized how quickly this stranger's demeanor had shifted. I desperately told Dan he needed to let me go immediately, but he only became more volatile and agitated, yelling it wasn't fair for me to leave him on all night only to ultimately reject him now at my door. Operating on pure adrenaline, I forcefully shoved Dan away from my car door. Slamming it quickly, I scrambled to get inside and hit the auto lock, my heart hammering. But before I could even start the engine, Dan suddenly ran around the car and jumped into the passenger seat. I was now trapped inside the closed vehicle alone with this enraged, entitled stranger. Mortified but fighting panic, I shakily warned Dan that I was calling the police right this instant. He merely laughed in a deeply unsettling, sinister manner as if I was being absurdly dramatic and overreacting to what he saw as harmless flirting. With trembling hands, I threw the car into drive and peeled out of the parking spot, careening toward the exit in hopes of ejecting him. 
Dan screamed at me, calling me foul names as we zoomed out onto the street. At the first stop sign just down the block, I came to a hard halt and leaped out, sprinting for home just a few buildings away. My fingers fumbled with my keys trying desperately to unlock the front door. I could hear Dan's heavy and raged footsteps rapidly approaching up the sidewalk behind me. He was spewing graphic threats about what he planned to do when he got a hold of me for trying to escape him. I finally got inside and slammed the door shut, deadbolting it just as Dan reached the entrance. He began violently pounding and kicking at it, growling threats at me to open up immediately and let him in. I was utterly terrified, but knew I had to keep a cool head. Operating on autopilot, I swiftly sprinted to the bathroom and locked myself securely inside. With hands shaking violently, I dialed the cops and urgently whispered what was happening to the operator. I could hear Dan roaring and clawing violently at my front door, sounding possessed with rage. The agent said officers were being dispatched and to stay barricaded until help arrived. Those next agonizing minutes felt like hours as I huddled there on the tile floor, listening to Dan scraping and kicking viciously at the wooden door, threatening the awful things he intended to do to me for rejecting it. Finally, I heard the blessed sound of police sirens and Dan swearing as multiple officers dragged him away. After what felt an eternity, a gentle knock came at the bathroom door, and a kind policewoman assured me the perpetrator was now in custody. After giving a full statement, police commended me for staying so level-headed in the face of danger. Apparently, this Dan had a lengthy record of violence against women who rejected him. The cops told me I had likely escaped being brutally assaulted or murdered by barricading myself and contacting them immediately. It turned out this predator had been stalking and assuming fake identities to meet up with multiple women from town under the guise of casual first dates. But the police finally tracked him down and he was sentenced to many years in prison. After a devastating recent breakup, my well-meaning friends finally convinced me to give online dating a try for the first time via Tinder. I was admittedly skeptical at first but eventually made a profile with some cute, flattering photos of myself, along with a clever little bio paragraph, all at their persistent urging. To my surprise, I quickly seemed to hit it off conversationally with a guy named Matt over the app, and we soon made plans to actually meet up in person for drinks that upcoming weekend. At first, Matt seemed totally normal and harmless based on our friendly messaging exchanges but it quickly became disturbingly clear once we met face to face that this was an incredibly unsafe situation I had put myself in. Matt's Tinder profile featured lots of recent pictures showing him hiking outdoors, hanging with friends at bars, and doing various activities. His witty bio highlighted his love of the outdoors, craft beers, and indie music. Our initial conversations over the app flowed very easily back and forth, with Matt coming across as super laid back, outgoing, open, and funny. When he politely asked if I wanted to join him for a casual drink downtown sometime, I suggested meeting at a popular, crowded brewery near me on a Friday night. Matt enthusiastically agreed that sounded perfect, and we set the plans in motion. The evening our planned meetup arrived, and I made sure to get to the bustling brewery early to try and secure a table. Every time the front door opened, I found myself glancing at hoping to spot Matt walking in based on the photos I recognized from his Tinder profile. Finally. A guy entered who looked just like one of Matt's main pictures and caught my eye. I waved discreetly to confirm it was in fact him, and he made his way over to join me at the table I had snagged. Matt looked pretty much identical to his pictures in real life and gave me a warm, seemingly genuine hug before sitting down across from me. We hit it off right away and fell into easy conversation over a couple of beers. But when there was a natural lull in the dialogue, I noticed Matt started acting kind of distracted and antsy constantly scoping out the crowded room rather than making eye contact with me. I wrote off his odd behavior as just normal first date jitters and tried to keep the give and take conversation flowing naturally. After we each had a few drinks, Matt enthusiastically asked if I felt like checking out the trendy cocktail bar next door that he said made amazing Moscow mules. I was honestly having a pretty fun time so far and agreed that could be fun. In hindsight, this is when things really started to take a disturbing turn. I got up to quickly use the restroom before heading to the next location, and when I returned, I found that Matt had already taken the liberty of moving down to two bar stools much closer to where I had been sitting before. It struck me as territorial and a major red flag. As the night wore on, Matt proceeded to inch his bar stool closer and closer so that we were uncomfortably pressed shoulder to shoulder. 
He also kept initiating increasingly invasive physical contact, a hand lightly placed on my shoulder, playing with my hair, grazing his hand against my thigh. All the while, the personal conversation topics he pressed me on took a much darker turn as well, with Matt prying about old relationships, family drama, and even asking my views on having kids someday. I gave only vague, polite answers in response and kept subtly trying to shift my body away whenever he encroached on my space. I started desperately looking for any feasible excuse to politely end this traumatic day early and head home safely alone. I finally pretended to suddenly get a concerned text from my roommate claiming my cat was extremely ill and vomiting, and that I was needed back immediately to help. Ever the hero, Matt immediately offered to accompany me all the way back to my apartment to check on my pet and make sure I was okay. This alarming gesture obviously raised major red flags and I insisted repeatedly that I was totally fine getting home by myself. I grabbed my purse and coat and headed briskly for the exit with Matt following unsettlingly close behind as I made a beeline for the street. My intention was to hail a cab immediately and make a solo getaway, but suddenly I felt Matt's hand aggressively grab hold of mine, pulling me back forcefully towards him. He protested that we should share another Uber ride together, but I harshly yanked my hand away from his grasp and frantically jumped into the back of the very first taxi I could flag down. My heart was absolutely pounding as Matt stood frozen on the sidewalk, just coldly staring at me, making no effort to get into the cab. I shrieked at the driver to please just go. It was only once I was safely back in my apartment that I saw the parade of unread, angry, and apologetic messages from Matt blowing up my phone. The stream of unhinged texts ranged from raging at me for leaving him stranded at the bar without a proper goodbye, to desperately backpedaling and begging for another chance to take me on a more romantic date. But by far the most disturbing message of all was when he somehow knew precisely which intersection I had instructed the cab driver to originally drop me off before having him route to my actual apartment building. I realized with horror that Matt must have followed closely behind in his own vehicle after I ditched him to flee alone in the taxi. I immediately blocked his number, but still could not calm my shaken nerves. The stalking and harassment escalated one evening when I arrived home from work to find a gift bag sitting on my doorstep addressed to me in an unfamiliar scrawl. Against my better judgment, I opened it to find a series of items inside that were clearly references to our one disastrous date. My favorite chocolates from a specialty brand we had discussed, a novel by an indie author he had recommended, a mixed CD containing songs from all the obscure bands he had raved about. Now having concrete proof that Matt had continued invading my privacy, I genuinely feared for my safety and what else this unhinged admirer was capable of. I immediately filed a police report with all the tangible evidence and took steps to tighten security at my apartment complex. Within just a couple days, the police informed me they had positively identified Matt through surveillance footage in my building and apprehended him for felony harassment and stalking charges thanks in large part to his extensive criminal record of prior restraining orders and disputes with other women. I learned the sickening truth that I was far from the first date Matt had obsessed over and terrorized when things went south. It was a harrowing wake-up call about the importance of properly vetting strangers online before ever agreeing to meet in real life. I still shudder thinking back on my Tinder date last night with Luke and how it could have ended so much worse. I'm incredibly grateful I caught what he was trying to do before things went further. The whole scary experience definitely opened my eyes to the dark side of online dating and will make me way more cautious moving forward. It had started out innocently enough. Matched on Tinder with Luke a few days prior. We texted back and forth. He seemed normal friendly. Worked as a financial analyst, had just moved to the area for his job. I thought he was cute, so when Luke asked to meet up for drinks, I said yes without hesitation. We planned to go to Murphy's Tavern, this popular pub near me. I arrived first and grabbed a table while waiting for Luke. Right on time, he showed up looking just like his pics. Tall, sandy brown hair, dimpled chin. He greeted me with a hug and we launched right into easy conversation. Luke insisted on getting the first round. He went to the bar and came back with two cocktails, sliding one over to me. We clinked glasses and sipped our drinks while swapping stories about growing up and past relationships. So far, so good. When we were about halfway through that first drink, I excused myself to the restroom to freshen up. Left my purse and phone at the table with Luke. Didn't think twice about it. How naive. As I was fixing my hair and makeup in the mirror, 
Owen rushed in looking panicked. In a hushed tone, she told me my date had slipped something in my drink while I was gone. My heart dropped. I couldn't believe it. I cautiously exited the bathroom and peered over at our table from a distance. Sure enough, there was Luke furtively stirring something into my cocktail, glancing around to make sure no one saw. The nice guy act had all been a ruse. He was trying to drug me. Adrenaline pumped through me. I had to get evidence and stop Luke right away. I dumped my phone out of my purse, hands trembling, and sneaked some photos of him in the act. Then I immediately went to find the bartender on duty, showing her the pics. Thank God the bartender believed me and sprang into action. She quietly called the cops while another employee kept an eye on Luke from afar. I remained hidden, not wanting him to see me and try to bolt. My mind was racing, heart pounding. This felt like something out of a movie. Within minutes, two police officers entered and strode right up to Luke, asking him to stand. When Luke denied doing anything wrong, they revealed someone had captured photographic evidence against him. The cocky smirk vanished from his face instantly. While the police questioned Luke, the bartender confirmed she had surveillance video footage as further proof. The officers searched Luke's pockets and, sure enough, found a small packet of powder. He was handcuffed and led away right there in front of the stunned pub crowd. I finally emerged from my hiding place, feeling shaky and overwhelmed with relief that Luke had been caught. The bartender kindly sat me down and got me some water while the adrenaline rush subsided. I knew I'd narrowly avoided becoming Luke's victim. The police took my statement and contact info, saying they'd be in touch regarding the case against Luke. They praised my quick thinking in capturing hard evidence to take him down. I was glad justice would be served, but the experience still rattled me to my core. After giving the officers all the details I could, I just wanted to go home and try processing it all. Thankfully, I had a friend pick me up so I didn't have to be alone that night. He brought me back to his place where I hold up feeling shell-shocked it had happened at all. Ever since that traumatic night, I'm much more apprehensive about online dating. It scares me thinking I so easily could have become a victim at Luke's hands if not for that one vigilant bathroom patron taking action. She saved me from a horrific fate. I used to be so naive, always giving people the benefit of the doubt, but Luke duping me with his nice act showed looks can be deceiving. From now on, I'll make sure to really vet any Tinder matches thoroughly and only meet in very public places. No more isolating bar dates, too risky. Maybe I'll even bring a friend along to help scope out any potential red flags I could be blind to with meeting someone new. And absolutely no accepting drinks I don't see poured myself. Hard lessons learned. As awful as it was, I guess the Luke incident helped me gain some street smarts about safety with online dating. I'll never again assume I have someone figured out just from a few friendly conversations. It's scary how easily a predator can hide behind a seemingly harmless profile. But at least now I'll know what to watch for and can better protect myself moving forward. Always listen to your gut, don't ignore red flags, and take precautions meeting strangers from the internet. Being skeptical and vigilant can truly save your life. In a messed up way, I'm grateful for that close call with Luke. It taught me crucial lessons and snapped me out of my navy real quick. While it absolutely rattled me to my core, it also empowered me to advocate for myself and be so much more careful. A hard way to get educated, but it may have saved me from something far darker down the line. I guess the moral of the story is to always watch your drink, go with your instincts, and don't take chances with strangers. One night of terror was enough for me. From now on, safety first. I remembered this like it was the other day, it all started normally enough. I matched on Tinder with this girl named Sophie a few weeks back. We had a fun, flirty banter over messaging. She was cute in her pics, petite, brown hair, the eyes. Said she was a nurse who had just moved to the area. I was into her and suggested we meet up for a drink. She readily accepted. We made plans to go to Murphy's Tavern, this low-key spot near my place. When I got there, I immediately spotted Sophie waiting out front. She looked exactly like her pics, which was a relief. I've been catfished before, so it was nice to see she was a real deal. Or so I thought. We hugged awkwardly and went inside to grab a table. The date started out pretty normal. We were laughing, swapping stories about ourselves, just generally hitting it off. She was funny and seemed sweet. I complimented Sophie on her looks just to be nice, and she lit up, gushing about how she never gets attention from cute guys like me. Heartless enough at the time. 
After a couple drinks, Sophie started getting more intense. She kept going on and on about how amazing I was and how lucky she felt to have met me. Started talking about taking trips together and wanting me to meet her family. I'm weird. I barely knew this girl. That's when the first red flags popped up that something might be off. The more questions I asked Sophie trying to get to know her better, the more vague or defensive her responses got. She skirted around anything too personal. Mentioned she had just gone through a messy breakup but didn't give any details. I also caught Sophie in a few weird lies, like saying she had a PhD when earlier she said she was an RN. She got flustered when I called out the discrepancy. Said she misspoke and actually had just started nursing school. But it made me suspicious. Things got weirder when Sophie stepped away to the restroom at one point. Out of instinct, I picked up her phone which she left on the table. That's when I saw the convo open with her roommate Jen addressing her as, well, not Sophie. My heart sank realizing I had been duped. This girl wasn't who she claimed to be at all. No wonder she got cagey whenever I asked about her personal life. It was all made up. When Sophie returned, I confronted her directly. To my shock, she broke down crying hysterically. She confessed her real name was Amy. She was in her 30s, not late 20s as she claimed, and had been lying because she was scared I wouldn't like the real her. I felt bad, but also freaked out and betrayed. That's when Amy dropped the bomb on me. She was in love with me and couldn't bear to lose me. She begged me to forgive her lies because we were meant for each other. She just knew I was a one. Um, after one date that she had catfished me on. Crazy. I got up to leave, but Amy latched on my arm desperately. She was causing a scene with her sobbing and hysterical pleas for me not to go. People were staring. I didn't know what to do. Finally, I agreed to step outside with her so we could talk more privately. Big mistake. On the sidewalk, her clinginess amplified times ten. She was borderline delusional saying we should move in together and get married, despite my reminding her we just met. When I tried to firmly tell Amy there was no chance of a relationship given the huge lies, she became inconsolable. She refused to leave my side, following me down the street rambling through her tears that she couldn't live without me. It was nuts. I managed to flag down a taxi to create some escape, but Amy tried to force herself into the cab with me. I barely wrestled free of her grasp and quickly gave the driver my address. As we sped off, I watched Amy chasing after the car for a block before giving up. I felt relieved to put distance between us, but also really freaked out. Who knew what she'd try tracking me down? As soon as I got home, I blocked her number and Tinder profile. No way was I letting this whack jump back into my life. It's been a few weeks now and thankfully Amy hasn't reappeared, but I'm still continually watching over my shoulder when I'm out, worried she might materialize. The whole bizarre experience shook me up for sure. I know better now than to take online profiles at face value. From now on, I'll be vetting any Tinder matches way more thoroughly right off the bat. And meeting only in public places, no more going to some random girl's apartment. I guess the Amy incident served as a good wake-up call. It reminded me that I've got to be way more cautious and skeptical when online dating. I could have unwittingly found myself tangled up with a legitimately unhinged person if I hadn't discovered Sophie's lies. At least now I can spot some red flags to watch out for in the future. Things like dodging personal questions, hitting too intense, too fast, velcro level clinginess. Telltale signs of someone who might not be the person they claim to be. In a messed up way, dealing with Amy's crazy gave me some valuable skills to apply for online dating safety. I'll never again make the mistake of blindly trusting a Tinder match or taking them at face value right off the bat. From now on, I'll make sure to vet anyone I meet online thoroughly before risking an in-person date again. Once bitten, twice shy. This whole catfish debacle definitely taught me to be way more vigilant protecting myself online. I'm just glad I escaped when I did and didn't end up stuck in some fatal attraction nightmare scenario. Amy was clearly unhinged, but at least now I know what red flags to watch for to avoid another crazy catfish scheme. Swiping days are over for me. From now on, I'll stick to meeting when I'm introduced to through friends. Lesson learned. When my roommate first convinced me to try Tinder, I rolled my eyes. From all the drama and horror stories, it seemed like it was mostly just a sketchy hookup app, not for actual relationships. But she said I should give it a shot anyway, so I made a profile. I set my preferences for guys around my age, figuring that was safest. Then I started swiping. I have to admit, it was kind of fun that first scene who matched with me. 
it was also super addicting trying to get more matches. I'd check it constantly, even more than I check social media. Soon I was regularly chatting with various guys. Some conversations fizzled out quick, but a couple guys seemed normal and nice. I still was wary about meeting any of them in real life though. How did I know they were who they claimed to be on their profile? But then I matched with Seamus. He was 10 years older than me in his late 20s, which concerned me a bit, but we really seemed to click while chatting. He was so witty and charming, and we liked all the same obscure bands and podcasts. I felt an instant connection, more than with anyone else I'd met on Tinder so far. When Seamus asked me out on a real date, I was thrilled but also hesitant. I'd never seriously considered going on a date with someone from Tinder before. My overprotective roommate made me promise to text her constantly with updates in case things went bad, but I figured one date couldn't hurt. We planned to meet at this trendy new gastro pub downtown that had amazing reviews. I arrived first and slid into a booth, smoothing my dress and trying to calm my nerves. I hoped he wasn't secretly some creep or, even worse, a serial killer. But when Seamus walked in, he instantly put me at ease. He looked just like his photos and was even more handsome and charming in person. We fell into easy conversation right away. The awkwardness I expected was totally absent. This felt genuinely fun. About an hour later, after we had finished eating, Seamus mentioned he was going to wash his hands. I realized I should too considering we had just been touching menus, silverware, etc. I grabbed my purse and headed to the back hallway by the restrooms. Out of nowhere, I heard yelling and commotion near our table. I turned to see Seamus being restrained by several large male customers. They had his arms pinned behind his back as he struggled to break free, looking around wildly. Before I could process this bizarre scene, two uniformed police officers rushed over. They slapped handcuffs on Seamus and Regan his rights as they escorted him outside. I stood there frozen in utter confusion and shock. A female officer gently guided me to a quiet corner of the restaurant and explained that another diner had witnessed Seamus slipping something into my drink when I left the table. This good Samaritan had noticed him stealthily remove a small packet from his pocket and empty the contents into my half-finished cocktail as soon as I was out of sight. Alarmed, she immediately spoke up and notified the staff of what she saw. The manager quickly called 911 reporting the incident. Within minutes, police arrived and located Seamus at our table, still sitting casually as if nothing was amiss. But they could see residue from the emptied packet sitting at the bottom of my drink. When confronted, Seamus claimed he had just been sweetening my drink for me. But the officers seized the glass and tested its contents, which revealed high levels of Rokitno mixed in better known as the infamous date or word drug. The blood drained from my face as the gravity of the situation hit me. This man I had conversed with, laughed with, trusted to meet in person, had secretly plotted to drug me unconscious tonight to assault me without my knowledge or consent. If that woman had not been observant and spoken of, I likely would have returned to the table clueless and finished my spike drink. I would have awoken hours later confused, injured, and in trauma with no memory of the horrors I had endured while incapacitated. I felt violated, betrayed, and disgusted realizing Seamus saw me as an easy target to take advantage of however he pleased. I meant nothing to him except an object to use for his own twisted desires. He knew slipping me a drug was the only way his evil plan would succeed. I ended up giving the police a lengthy statement, providing screenshots of our Tinder conversations as evidence. They informed me Seamus was already a known sex offender who used dating apps to find and prey on unsuspecting girls. I later learned he had done this to multiple women, slipping drugs into their drinks on first dates and violating them while they were incapacitated and helpless. He saw us as objects to use however he pleased, with zero regard for consent or human decency. The chilling experience left me feeling violated, disgusted, and so grateful that I escaped becoming another of his victims. If not for someone speaking of, I likely would have woken up from that day confused and in trauma if I had woken up at all. I am still haunted knowing I let my guard down and gave this monster a chance. But it also lit a fire in me to advocate for other young women targeted by predators, especially on unregulated dating apps. By sharing my story, hopefully others can avoid finding themselves in similarly dangerous situations. After the traumatic ordeal, I deleted all my dating apps and took a long break from trying to meet guys online, but I refused to become jaded or distrustful of the many good people still out there. One evil person does not negate all the kindness and compassion in this world.
This unsettling encounter opened my eyes about exercising immense caution when online dating, listening to my gut instincts, and never fully letting my guard down with someone brand new. But I also gained faith in humanity, seeing firsthand how brave Vistaners look out for each other and intervene when something seems off. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.